Hello and welcome to Holy Wars, a podcast about religion, coexistence, and the people trying to figure it out. My guest today is Siraj Hajmi, a journalist with the Washington Examiner and regular CNN contributor. Siraj and I have been friends for a long time, and I really wanted to have him on the podcast because he's one of the very few Pakistani-American Muslims that I know who work in conservative media. We talk about Twitter outrage, impeaching Trump, censorship of conservatives, Alex Jones, abortion politics, Pakistan, Catholic infighting, whether Trump is a fascist, and which Democratic candidate can beat him. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe, rate it five stars, share it with your friends, and donate to my Patreon. Thank you. And welcome to Holy Wars. Siraj, how's it going, man? I'm doing well, Jeremy. How about yourself? Good. What are you, uh, what are you doing today? Uh, well, it's been an interesting time because the summer is sort of dead. Yeah. But uh, Trump is keeping everything quite entertaining uh, with his ABC News interview that happened this past week. Are you still entertained by Trump? You know... I would, there's some times where I'm like, all right, he's up to his old sticks again. He's, you know, he has like a particular, like, uh, he has a set of classic hits. Like if you're going to a concert mm-hmm. and then every now and then he'll play some new stuff. And it's always <laughs> the new stuff that really is entertaining. So, yeah. uh, and that's always the stuff that usually makes news. If, I mean, I have, uh, on Twitter, um, the Trump tweet alert just ready to go. So mm-hmm. whenever I see something, um, I usually disregard it almost immediately, but then when I see like it uh, constantly popping up on my timeline, uh, that's usually when I'm like, okay, this is something new. Let's see what's let's let's. If you let's have the alert he's... on, you need to become one of those guys in his replies. <laughs> you, now that you saying Krasen, I need to be whatever, I need to be the next uh, Krasenstein brother or yeah, because uh, if you go to any Jacob of Trump's Wall. tweets, right, and, and you look in the replies, it's just the worst people who are. I mean, they're getting retweeted and getting faved and stuff because people think that, I don't know, people think that Trump reads his replies or something. But it's just the most, like, autopilot, like, normie kind of response that anyone can write. And... Right. And it's just, yeah. And, and so you need... And, and, but all of the people doing it have, like, hundreds of thousands of followers because of it. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's, it's the... Uh I don't know what it's actually called, but I think there was like reply grifting or something like that. Mm, that's a good. That's a good. Some term of these for people. It. So these people, they sort of just build up their followings by solely responding to Trump tweets, and the Krasenstein brothers are a great example because they were, and many people were wondering if it, if they were kind of putting up an act, mm-hmm. but they are like genuinely. Uh, posting and replying to Trump. Uh, That's crazy. Like genuinely outraged at what he tweets. and Oh, like know, they're, they're actually emotionally invested in it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think in the last month they got banned from Twitter because they constantly, that if, if, I think it was discovered that they um, started up a bunch of fake accounts oh, that, right. went up, that went against uh, Twitter policy. See, I just kind of assume that anyone who is on Twitter a lot. Anyone who's like heavily online, there's a certain way of speaking that is uh, where the currency is like how you are emotionally invested in the news. Mm -hmm. And so like a news thing will happen and you'll be like, this has just got my blood boiling. And it's, it's all about their reaction. Right. It's, it's not like it, this is wrong. It, it's like it's like this has just cut me to the core. I'm devastated to hear this. You know, and it's like they're they're validating like their own reactions just right. by by it's just whatever emotional reaction they have. And and but I just because I I'm I'm, I'm online a lot, and I just assume that everyone who's typing that doesn't believe it. <laughs> like like they're not actually shaking. They're not actually upset. They're just really calmly typing that they're really upset right and they've sort of made it part of their persona and i think I, i've seen a couple of accounts pop up recently uh i i, I think uh i can't recall the actual account's name because they blocked me mm. <laughs> but it was uh it was one of the social justice warrior types i think it's sarah rao okay Cy- yeah she got she, she's been getting uh i think she 
writes for like Brown Girl magazine. Yeah, yeah. So and I've, and I've she's never, been getting really, r- really hammered for for stuff she's tweeted. Yeah, so she's been the, she's an interesting character to me because um, it, if if she is genuinely who she is online as she is in person, like mm-hmm. that's a lot of anger and rage to like right. be worked up over all the time. Like it's mm-hmm. just. There's just not enough time in, in life to be that angry at everything. Right. So, I mean. So I, they, I always I, assume that those people, you know, I read stuff like that and I'm like, well, there's, it's just an act. And then you find out it's not. And it's, it's, it can be, it can be sad. Yeah. Like with Alex Jones, mm. uh, I think with his deposition through his divorce proceedings, uh, I think over the last, I think it was at least a year ago, mm-hmm. we found out that he was putting up an act. Um, I think a lot of a lot of his fans a would not believe it because mm-hmm. they think he's being genuine. But everyone who's ever watched his program and has been skeptical of anything he's ever said, which is pretty much m- most of us, would be like, "Yeah, that makes sense." I mean, he can't possibly believe all the stuff he says, right? Like, it's got to be at least uh, it, it's it's like an ironic thing where where you are. And I I fall into this sometimes with like the Catholic stuff where you're saying things you believe right you're not lying mm-hmm. um, but you're saying it in a way that's like also a little bit ironic um, and no, where, give me an example what do you mean where, where where you're just pushing things like you know towards that um, like well for Alex Jones. Right. Like, so he, he really does. I mean, he, he's not just an actor. He's, he really does believe in these conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. Um, and he is, uh, but at the same time, you, you know, he's having fun and he's playing it up and he's also playing a character. So he's playing a very extreme version of himself. Right. Um, and like, that's, that's pretty easy to do and it's fun. Um, and, I, but, but, uh, you know, so when, when it, you know, it, when it came out that Alex Jones was, uh, that a lot of it was an act, um, I was, I was thankful just for the guy, <laughs> like, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's, he's not doing as bad as I thought he was. I mean, like, you know, not that I liked him, but like, it's just, you know, like, okay, well I, I think, uh, you know, he's, but, but at the same time that can be really dangerous because there are people who will take you seriously. Um, oh, 100%. And, and uh, you can joke so- about, uh, like, you can joke like you're an extreme version of yourself. Um, like, like with the Catholic stuff, like, like, like I'm going to reinstate the monarchy, right? Like in America, like that kind of stuff's a joke, right? Mm-hmm. But it's like, you know, I don't think monarchy's all that bad. So like, you know, it's, it's like a little bit, it's like a tongue in cheek version of myself. Um, but like, that there is a kind of thing where you have to be careful where, okay, who's, you know, I have like 150,000 followers on Twitter. Like, okay, who's, who's watching this? Uh, and like what percentage of that is our crazy people? Cause there's a percentage that are crazy people. And are they going to take it seriously? You know, like, and you can't just, and this is something that I'm not, I go back and forth with this about whether uh, people with big followings are responsible for how their fans act. You know, right, with like Milo Yiannopoulos, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, where sort of like, him. you know, after a while, I mean, it's it's one thing to like say something like, ah, oh, I just ate at this restaurant and man, it was really bad. And then like the next day you wake up and you find out that like one of your fans blew it up. Like that's not, you're not responsible for that. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But like yeah. you are responsible if you like tag someone or if you like quote tweet someone. Right. Let's say that you quote tweet someone and call them. An and idiot. then all your fans are sicked on them. And then you look at and then you click through, you know, a few hours later and you find out that like all your fans have been extremely abusive to them. Like, does that make you worried or does that give you like a thrill? Like, oh, look what I can do huh. now. You know, like I think I think that's like a, a real like test of character for that. Where like people like Milo, like they, you know, he got kicked off of Twitter because he went after um, uh, Leslie Jones. Leslie and, Jones, yeah. um, like he knew what his followers were doing and he knew that whenever he did that, she would, she got like a, a you know, a barrage of horrible abuse. Mm-hmm. And so like the, the question is, what are you going to do with that power? And I think, uh, I think it's not, 
fair to be like, well, I'm not responsible at all. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure there's a, a there is an amount of culpability that everyone has on Twitter and on social media in general, and it's. It's funny because it it started off with some of the worst characters in like Molly Annopolis and then like Laura Loomer and then Jacob Wall and Alex Jones. And then it started getting into the area where some people who are not really on the fringe but, you know, tend to poke the bear a bit are starting mm-hmm. to get either suspended or locked out of their accounts or, or, or basically getting kicked off of these social media platforms. Now all of a sudden... You're seeing a lot of conservatives say that um, the you know global tech giants are censoring conservatives, which uh, I mean I don't know if there's a strong enough yeah, what argument do you think to about say. That? Uh, you know, there's there's something to be said about um, certain parts of the debate that people go after. I think the one thing that uh, really conservatives are up in arms about is when they talk about um, trans rights and mm-hmm. when it. And I am not really a, um, I don't really feel strongly about, uh, about the issue one way or the other. I'm more the just, you know, live and let live type of guy. And, um, when Mm -hmm. it comes to the debate about how, uh, we shape our policy towards, uh, transgender people, people on the conservative or on the fringe right are very much focused in ensuring that there are only two genders, which they want to make that hill to die on rather than just respecting the other individual's right to mm-hmm. exist. Um, and they end up getting kicked off by, say, uh, say misgendering somebody, right. um, which I think is probably could be construed as a form of abuse. It may seem um, pretty tame to the person doing the abusing, but I'm sure to the individual who's receiving the abuse – it's um, it's sort of uh, a a comment that can invalidate their own existence. So I'm I'm more on the lines of like let these private companies figure out what the hell it is where they what standard they actually have, and just don't try to make a double standard. Like if 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 say someone on the left is um, you know going after someone on the right for say something like the issue of abortion and they Mm -hmm. don't end up getting banned for it then they obviously kind of open up um some sort of pandora's box here where um you know people really starting to feel that conservatives are being censored as opposed to liberals and um in that regard i guess i could see a little bit of it but it's I don't feel like tech giants are going out of their way to ban all of these people. Yeah, it it reminds me of someone someone once said, like, the difference between Protestant and Catholic morality is that Protestants have a few rules that they follow very strictly, and Catholics have tons of rules that no one follows. (laughs) Um, And and I think that's, that's like, a helpful way of thinking about, uh, like, social media. Because there's all these, like, you know, terms of conditions and, you right. know, ter- terms and conditions which uh, you agree to do this stuff. And it's so broad that, like, you, you, you never really know if you're breaking the rule or not. And, like, is it harassment to argue with someone? Um, is it harassment to argue, like, to criticize a public figure? Mm-hmm. Um, and is that in, is it incitement to violence to say that someone's uh, wrong about something? And you know how how far does that go? Um, and the, these social co- you know social tech companies they have these you know standards that are so broad that then that allows them just to like kick people out they don't like. Um, and yeah. so they kick people off the platforms basically just whenever they cause too much trouble. That's really what the rule is. Yeah. It's like, don't cause and, and, too much trouble on Twitter. Yeah. And uh, they've gotten on some accounts for, say, using music that wasn't licensed to them. And, you know, mm-hmm. th- those things are like fair. But uh, I think it's the policing of certain individuals who it's it's sort of like setting up the, the cops in the conservative neighborhood, waiting for them to just slip up and then like basically sending the SWAT team in on them. Mm. Uh, as opposed to like wherever a liberal camp you want to you want to focus on. Uh, well, it's, but, it's sort mean, of like the, I mean, it, 
yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, you're being Catholic. You're obviously pro-life. I mean, the, the, mm-hmm. the, but you're also politically more liberal than I am. You would probably get a lot of heat if you talked about uh, the issue of abortion a lot. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think you really do. Well, I talk about it some. Um, but I think that I, I, don't, I don't beef with people right. about that. I, I don't know what good that would do. I mean, maybe it would. I don't know. Well, but I, and I think you recognize that. If people's minds aren't going to get changed on Twitter.com or any social media platform through a Twitter argument. Right. I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think people uh, shortchange social media sometimes when, I mean, because no one's going to admit that their mind really changed because mm-hmm. of a social media argument. No one's going to say like, well, how did you do this? Well, people memed me into, you know, doing this, <laughs> uh, you know, I, while That'd I That'd be wild. <laughs> right. Um, but I think it, it I, but but I think it does happen, and I think it's just embarrassing to admit that it's happened. Um, I think that uh, I mean I I learn tons of stuff on social media every day um, from the people that I interact with. I have my uh, people, you know, who are nice about it, and I I have my I have my mind changed about that. Um, it Jeremy, also let creates, me just say I think yeah. I've learned more about Pakistan and Islam through yeah. you and Perfect. your ex- and your ventures. Yeah, and you uh, live there. And I lived there for six years growing yeah. up, and I'm, I've been uh, practicing Muslim for uh, all my entire life. So it's, it's kind of funny, actually. Well, that, that raises the question, though, of whether um, social media provides an accurate view of, um, like, b- because if, if, if what you just said is true, that, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I mean, you're being somewhat, like, ironic about it, like, you know, that you've learned more from from my conversations with people that might suggest that my conversations with people about islam or about pakistan is stuff that the the average person doesn't know um w- which means that i'm not getting an accurate view mm-hmm. of of reality right so like you know your understanding of like the catholic debates um, there is a Catholic debate going on right now about politics and about, you know, between people at the National Review and people about first things, about uh, government and liberalism and stuff. And it's a very interesting conversation, and I think it's really fascinating. Um, I guarantee you literally no one at Mass yesterday knows about that debate going on. And that's what's fun. <laughs> I, I think I've said this so much in the last couple of months is that Twitter and social media in general – it's just not real life. Like it's just it's it's, it's these, not real life, but it can, like, it can be a microcosm for what's right, happening. Right, it, 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 it can be a microcosm, but even even more than that, it can be the vanguard. It can be the people who are, um, like, in in good ways and bad ways. So so like the people who write for National Review and write for you know first things, they're having this like high high level discussion. Well, that'll that'll trickle down to articles and um, you know people speaking at colleges and you know what professors at colleges are reading and and talking about and uh and and the same is true of of radicals of people who are um you know radicalized online which happens all the time where right. on if you if you go on twitter and you get into uh, a debate about a topic like you're going to encounter the most extreme people on that because it takes yeah. like i mean let's you know just take abortion like it takes you know, it's it's not just that someone's pro life; is that they're the kind of pro life person who starts a pro life uh, Twitter account, for example, mm-hmm. and uh, tweets about it for several hours a day. That takes a certain type of person who's like particularly committed to that issue on either side, and so when you see that, like you're like, this is not a good representation of what America is like. Right. Um, but it, 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 but it, it does have an effect. Like, is, you know, someone who gets radicalized online, they don't just stay online. They can go to a mosque in New Zealand and kill a bunch of people. Um, right. They can bully people into, uh, you know, uh, into starting, you know, uh, movements that then shape um, America because, like, you it just takes like 10% of, of the population who are, are like super committed to one thing to convince everybody else. Cause most people just go along. Oh yeah. Most people really do not care about the realm of politics. I mean, I think, think of the, the people think of how smart the average person is. And I remember that like half the population is dumber than that. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and like you just have to, or like, just they're like well, like they're doing other things. Yeah, I'm like pretty if much Trump, everything. Like if Trump really did um, become uh, like a full fledged fascist, um, mm-hmm. I wonder about this. Like, would most of the people in America notice? Like it's not That's like a, you would you would you wouldn't necessarily have tanks going down the streets. I I bet regular life would feel about the same for most people in America. It would get very awful for like certain people in America, um, but I think most people, just the average person, would be like you know well you know I, like the, like the news is sad, but m- you know my life hasn't changed that much. <laughs> right, the economy is still great. You know, yeah. <laughs> I still my four hundred one k is still solvent like that. Right. It's. It, I, I agree. I, I would. I would definitely say that for election night twenty sixteen, that mm-hmm. may have been the sentiment that a lot of people have. Is that um, well, my life not hasn't necessarily changed, right. but I imagine for many other people, it's uh, changed uh, and either gotten better or gotten immeasurably worse. I mean, has and, your life changed? I mean, you're. I mean, besides being on CNN talking about talking about Trump in and, and a, and a tan suit uh, a tan how has suit. your <laughs> how, I mean how has your life changed under Trump um, if I were still doing the same thing uh, probably not that much different um, if anything I would say life has only gotten better since I graduated from college in 2009 mm-hmm. and Obama was president in his first year I mean I I wasn't really necessarily hit by the uh, the Great Recession because I was trying to go to medical school, mm-hmm. and then I think in like 2012 that's when I decided to do a career switch to media and journalism, and that mm-hmm. was just one of those in- that's that's one of those industries where you just have to just start from the very bottom and just work your way up, and I can't really speak to how say. Uh, someone who was working at one of these manufacturing plants that ended up closing up shop and going to China or, you know, was a a farmer who's been affected by say the trade war with China. Like I can't speak to how much any of the policies of any of these presidents has impacted me. But I will say uh, if we're looking at sort of the bigger picture here, uh, it seems that just public attitude shape, However, you know, however, the president conducts himself mm-hmm. in office and based on how much you care or wherever your political leanings, you can honestly tell um, how attuned that person is or how much they actually care about specific issues based on who's in office. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of the, I think I, I, you may have seen the sign, but there was a protest, I want to say, early 2018 focusing on the government shutdown and it was about uh i think it was if hillary was in office we'd all be at brunch yeah yeah yeah. did you did you see that yeah, yeah it's like well that's so, the problem exactly like yeah. people don't care about politics unless it's somebody that they vehemently de- uh, oppose uh ideologically um that has all the power and well, I've, th- I've thought about that in relation to trump where uh, like you, you, you and I belong to a certain class of people who uh, make money by talking and, <laughs> right. and writing. And we're we the political live. elite now, Jeremy. Let's just get used. I to mean, it. we live in our heads, right? And <laughs> yeah. uh, and like we are relatively insulated from the effects of policy. Um, and if if uh, if Trump decided to start a war tomorrow with Iran, um, I wouldn't get drafted. I, I bet my life wouldn't change that much, um, even though he just bombed a country, right? Um, uh-huh. And so we can have opinions about it, but our our opinions are kind of um, just sort of floating in the air, and and so we live sort of kind of in our heads. Whereas like like there's an entire class of people. Uh, just everyone other than us who are actually af- affected by this stuff. Right. And Trump, I think, you know, he has had an effect on on people's daily on people's day to day lives. Um, I think uh, his a lot of his immigration stuff ha- has has had a really big effect on people's lives. Um, but I I think his words have driven people like us crazy. 
um, <laughs> like people in our class, right, who are 100%. normally insulated from the effects of policy, who who it didn't really re- it didn't really matter if if George W. Bush was president or if Obama was president because they both talked nice, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Trump does not talk nice, and Trump has this ability to really injure people who who uh, work in the class, who in our class, right? Who are yeah. uh, who are just constantly just mentally deteriorating every day. Right, and I think you've mentioned this before. I think the the goalposts have shifted quite a bit uh, according to how. You know, the political and the media elite cover this presidency. Uh, I mean, remember, I, I think you I think you said specifically on uh, online that back in what I think in early in the in Jimmy Carter's presidency or sometime during it, he said he mentioned in an article that he's lusted before. Oh, right. Yeah. And, that he... and like everybody lost their shit. Like everybody could not understand a president mm-hmm. saying this. It was a new yeah, he had, he, a boundary. He, he did an interview with across. Playboy where he said that he had lusted after a woman in his heart. And, yeah. you know, who hasn't? And he's he's just and he just got pillarized for it. And. My great uncle was his spiritual advisor. Uh, oh, wow. My great uncle William R. Cannon uh, is a bishop in the in the Methodist Church, and he was he was Jimmy Carter's spiritual advisor. And he had to he was in an airport. The story goes he was in an airport when he heard about Jimmy Carter's interview, and so he had to go buy a Playboy uh, <laughs> just for the article so that he could he could read it. And oh, you know he's got God. his collar on and everything. And so that's that that's oh. the story anyway. I don't know if that's actually true, but. That's, That's the so sort funny. of family <laughs> legend of William R. Cannon. I actually have a I actually have a buddy who uh, is a cor- like a Washington correspondent for Playboy, and so I think he 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 had his first um, published article uh, that came out in this quarterly issue, mm-hmm. and I think he just he got a uh, a video of his dad reading Playboy, saying like he's actually reading it for the articles. Oh, that's hilarious! <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so when we talk about like Trump, it's just such a new age that people just, they can't, some people are still trying to adjust to him because they cannot fathom a president behaving the way he is. While uh, many of us who have observed Trump throughout the course of his career is like, this is completely on brand for him. Like, this is not like, he's not going to change just because he's the president. I mean, he's, Mm -hmm. he was the oldest elected eldest elected president in the history of our country. I think it was like 70 and like uh, a few dozen days when he was actually sworn into office beating out Ronald Reagan. Like people don't change at 70. No, no. Yeah. Uh, Who who, who does that? Who's yeah. And people barely change at 30. Like uh, usually what is this? What's the common saying? Like usually you're the person who you are at 30 for the rest of your life. Like Mm. that's who, that's the type of person you're going to be. And uh, I, I think uh, if Trump is you know, a, a playboy, uh, likes to brag about how much money and how many women he's got and uh, you know, all these properties he has and how he's like the smartest person in the room, tells the best jokes, is the life of the party, like that's him as president. And then we just, mm-hmm. thought, I mean, well, interestingly I d- I enough, don't think like, people are surprised that he's the same person. I think people are surprised without you know with, with, with good reason surprised that he has not changed at all after becoming president because there i think there is some value to hypocrisy mm-hmm. where you know you have presidents who are um uh who wage war right who are warmongers right. um you know george w bush gets up there and he's like you know well we need to you know, do the do these actions and stuff, and using all these euphemisms. So you're like, are we even at war? It doesn't feel like it. And yeah. like Trump's like up there, like we're gonna blow the hell out of them, and it's gonna be <laughs> awesome. It's gonna be tons of blood. It's great, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, he didn't say that, but like that's that's the kind of like thing you get where he's he's just literally saying, and he's proud of it. And you're like, okay, but like the ruler of a country does have an effect on yeah. uh, on people and on how you view war and how you view virtue and stuff. And, and, and ideally, you know, you would have a president who's virtuous, but if you can't have that, you at least want one that pretends to be. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I actually think this is what's interesting is because, um, a lot of people 
a lot of people cast a lot of blame on uh, Bush for starting two wars, for sure. And I, I don't feel like there's enough people talking about the extra war that uh, Obama got us into in right. Libya. And like that's that's kind of and that's what's so interesting is because that was downplayed so much during his presidency. Mm-hmm. Not only was it uh, in 2011 around the Arab Spring and and everything was sort of just popping off in the Middle East, but it, he also acted unilaterally without Congress in, in a way that uh, probably went a step further beyond what George W. Mm-hmm. Bush did because at least he got the authorization of use of military force from Congress to go mm-hmm. into both Afghanistan and Iraq. Right. Uh, with Obama, it was just, he just sent troops there and, you know, said Congress be damned and we're just going to go ahead and do it. And I have yeah, no idea. I have no idea what's happening in Libya now, but it's one of those things where like, uh, he's not dinged nearly enough as Bush is for Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, it's, it's, it certainly had a big impact on the refugee crisis. Um, oh Europe, yeah, absolutely. Where you know, getting once once Gaddafi fell and Libya became somewhat of a failed state, uh, you know, the the amount of refugees that flooded into, um, and then also Obama's messing up with Assad and everything like that, mm-hmm. uh, and so like <laughs> like Obama may have caused fascism in Europe. Like that's <laughs> that's not a small mistake to make. Um, right. There's that, and then there's also. I mean, like the pendulum swings, obviously the furthest to the other extreme, I guess, whenever you have someone in power. And so mm-hmm. with Obama, uh, everybody thought by, by 2008 standards that he was a quote unquote socialist with the Affordable Care Act, or at least looking to reform our health care system so that it was moving towards single payer, that all of these Republicans started moving so much further to the right to try to oppose it, mm-hmm. that they like low key became all. Uh, not all of them, but a good chunk of them became so uh, involved in making sure that like this nationalist populist movement happened through the Tea Party that ended up, you know, manifesting itself into Trump's 2016 presidency. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like Obama was such a big celebrity in the Democratic Party that he did not do enough to make sure that the baton was passed down to the next person because you and I, I think you and I have both been very critical of Hillary Clinton. She, her, the idea of Obama passing the baton to Hillary Clinton, uh, just does not sound no. like a, uh, did not sound like a, uh, a enticing, uh, route for America to go down. Well, let's talk about, uh, about Trump and whether, do, do you see him getting impeached at all? No, I don't. Um, uh, Actually, well, I'll say this. I think if he gets impeached, it will obviously go through the House and it will be dead in the Senate. I I don't think whatever uh, the Democrats are trying to do by making this convincing case that they're doing all these congressional investigations so they could basically say that they crossed all their T's and dotted all their I's Mm -hmm. and saying they did their due diligence and this is what we came up to. A lot of it is about uh, their agenda in 2020. If they're yeah, I mean, say- congressional investigations. I always just think of as um, like opposition research. For, huh. Yeah, f- like Absolutely. for the for like for the campaigns, just whatever the next campaign is. Right, and, and I think uh, very some people think these congressional investigations are happening in good faith, and I don't necessarily believe that. Nah, be- because the election season is upon us now. If they were trying to do these congressional investigations after Trump got reelected, then you could probably make a case that it's all about impeachment. But for for right now, I'd have to say that if they were going to move down towards impeachment, it would strictly be so that they'd have a political message for 2020 that goes beyond and just saying we hate Trump or orange man bad uh, to just say that, you know, donate to us, vote for us. Uh, elect us to office because we are not as say quote unquote corrupt or as uh, ethically or morally ambiguous as this president. Yeah. I I don't see the Democrats right now having a, a clear message. I I, I think that there are certainly candidates, you know, who are running for office who, who have a clear message. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I don't see the democratic party itself having 
any kind of, of, of clear message as to, you know, what kind of politics they want, like what kind of policies they want, um, what kind of foreign policy they want. It's, it's all driven by hatred of Trump. Yeah, they're arguably more divided than uh, the Republican Party, which is kind of wild if you think about it, because uh, I, I would argue that the division within the Republican Party right now is the reason why Trump, A, doesn't have a wall, and B, uh, probably uh, hasn't enacted uh, most parts of his agenda, whether they be some of these trade deals um, or even, uh, say, completely overhauling the immigration system that um, we have in place. And it, it um, is weird that he doesn't have a wall. I know, isn't it? It's I mean, the I don't, one thing I don't, that, like, I'm not a fan of the wall, but like, it's weird that like he ran on that. That was the main thing. And then he won. And all the Republicans were like, yeah, we're definitely going to get a wall. And, <laughs> and like, we don't have a wall yet. Right. It's and weird. It's and it's really not that expensive. Like, it's, it's, it's less expensive than all these other stuff that he spent money on. Oh, so for it's sure. like, it can't be that. Like, it, like, so what is, I mean, like, well, like, what is it? Do they just want to keep their lives? It's, it's multiple, th- uh, multiple things at play because um, there are many people in the political elite who benefit from uh, illegal immigration and from basically low-skilled labor Mm -hmm. and that low-skilled labor coming in the form of undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have obviously like, say like the Koch brothers faction. Um, I mean, you know, you know of them very well. I'm not saying you're uh, tied to them, but you know who they are. No, I, I was tied (laughs) to them when I, back in my, that's, that's how we met was, uh, Oh, back that's in, right. <laughs> back in, back in my yeah. libertarian days, and my uh, you know my uh, you know doing shows for uh, for I, y'all, I, it keeps their profit margins up. And there are there are many people within the Republican Party and in the corporate world who believe that building a wall or making it more difficult to obtain that low skilled labor um, will hurt their bottom line. And um, Democrats probably could argue the same i'm sure there i'm sure there are many democrats in the corporate world who say they uh, they may be morally opposed to the building of a border wall but i think they have the same issue where it's profit margins that they they benefit just as much from low skill labor as uh, republicans do but yeah it's it is kind of crazy that they've talked about the wall so much and there's just been nothing but holdups going on um, on the southern border, and uh, obviously you can't build a, a wall along the entirety of the border because you uh, you're going to have to invoke eminent domain along a lot of these private properties, and um, you're going to have to see a lot of these uh, cases go to court. But in in some respects, you know, you have the Rio Grande. You can't. So they they're just putting putting boats on the Rio Grande to to police them. You're not going to. Yeah, I guess the, gonna, the idea of the wall is. You know, when you imagine the wall, it's very clean and like very simple, and 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 that's probably preferable to the reality, which is that if they did build the wall, every step of the building of it would be fraught with controversy, and there would be constant news stories about this particular, you know, section of it did this mm-hmm. to this, and uh, like this lawsuit went, went, you know, went here, and this person got stopped, and it's like, okay, like it, I I can see why Trump even though I'm sure he does want the wall, it's, it's almost more useful as a thing to just have. It, 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 it almost reminds me of, of abortion, where the mm-hmm. Republican Party says they, uh, at least nationally, say they want to ban abortion. And, um, okay, well, they haven't. Uh, yeah. And they've had you know, control for quite a while. Um, and they controlled both houses and they controlled the presidency and they didn't defund Planned Parenthood. So, you know, you start to wonder, like, do they actually want to do this or do they realize it would be really messy? Yeah. Um, and like the first woman that died because she she didn't get an abortion would be on the front page of every paper. And like so instead they want to have this uh, very nice uh, kind of this idea of being pro-life and have that be, you know, and, and, and just keep 
you know, taking the football away, like yeah, and, like, and, like Charlie Brown, and sort of piggybacking off of that point, you think of how the issue of gun control and the Second Amendment comes into play here. Mm-hmm. When you have a government that's entirely controlled by Republicans, as we did in the last two years, um, the issue about gun control seems to be settled for that time being because uh, nobody's moving to actually restrict guns. Um, Mm -hmm. And it may happen in, say, state or local governments at the very most. But what you're seeing is that the fundraising for, like, the National Rifle Association, like one of the biggest gun lobbies in the United States, uh, that plummeted. And they (laughs) they had to cut a number of people from, say, their NRA TV outlet. Interesting. Um, and uh, gun sales went down. I mean, if you were talking about the best person that was ever, uh, the best president for gun sales was Obama because he constantly talked about guns, about restricting guns, the sale of guns. And, um, every single time he mentioned something like that after say a school shooting or a shooting of, uh, you know, any particular public or, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, establishment, uh, gun sales would then go up. It's it's because people constantly think that he's going to the the next day get legislation passed or issue an executive order banning the sale of uh, a particular weapon. So um, Trump's that might actually help done- explain so- something I was talking with a friend of mine about uh, a few days ago, which is that like I I always say like the, like the ACLU has r- had like a lot of mission creep mm-hmm. where like they seem to be focused just on like civil liberties and. Uh, and, and that was like their main thing. <clears throat> and then as time went on, they sort of branched out and are now just like a proxy for the, for the democratic party. Right. Um, and I was, I was talking about the NRA where the NRA, uh, was like, okay, it's a gun lobby, right? It's a gun lobby. And then like the NRA TV was like these snowflakes at these college universities. <laughs> and you're like, does this have anything to do with guns? Why is this? What, what's going on here? But that helps explain it because if the NRA doesn't need to exist uh, as much mm-hmm. under Republican administrations, then it's, it has to find some other thing to, you know, get people donate here and we'll right. stick it to the liberals. I, I think that one of the best cases uh, that, that kind of just focuses on just pure unadulterated red meat anger is watching Sean Hannity on Fox News. Mm. Now, I don't know if you watch him. I don't. Um, but I do from time to time um, because of uh, my fiance and, and she's interest, her family's obviously interested in <laughs> what he has to say. <laughs> explain your, explain your, I mean, nobody listening, you know, like. Uh, what do you want me to explain? Well, your, your, your fiance, she's Republican. Yeah. So she's, she never says she's a Republican. She okay. says she's more of like a constitutionalist. Mm, constitutionalist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another way of saying, yeah. uh, sort of a, an originalist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say the, the, it's interesting to me because I am not a conservative. A lot of people like to brand me as conservative, but I sort of just watch. Uh, I think I think some people have also characterized me as um, this Vox writer. Her name's Jane Coaston, and she oh, yeah. observes a, she observes a lot of you know Trump world and conservatives, and sort of writes about it a lot. Mm-hmm. I sort of do something similar, but I'm mostly, I, I, I mean, she would, char- Emily, my fiance, she would characterize me as a lip. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but if I'm ever watching Sean Hannity, like this guy, regardless of how much, say, Trump is vindicated, say, by the Mueller report, like this guy is so angry night after night. Like it's just nonstop anger coming from this guy because he wants to like make everybody who ever went after Trump pay for their, their mistakes to pay for ever even trying him. And that's just like the new level of like cultish mindset. Like he's going to join the, um, the Munich, like the, like the movie Munich. He's, he's going to join the team that like goes after each person and kills them. Like, like, like the assassination squad. Yeah, and it's just, it's, I mean, that's kind of an extreme example, but yeah. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the first thing that popped in my head. But like, he, like, it would be really easy to get him to join that. Yeah. To be and, like, and, you know, if Trump was like, all right, we're going to start killing everybody who came after me, would you join this? I feel like Hannity would. Yeah, and, and Hannity is just one of those guys that would, 
it, if it came down to it, absolutely would take a bullet for Trump no matter what. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's weird though because like we in the first two years or two and a half years of Trump's presidency, uh, there has been somewhat of a uh, a shift in the ratings in which you know MSNBC and CNN were going up and Fox News is going down. But mm-hmm. since the Mueller report, Fox News is back on the rise and all of MSNBC and CNN's is going down in the tanks. I'm trying to yeah. figure out, like, is it just that people are tired of watching? Like, they, they because they, uh, at least the resistance, the hashtag, the resistance, um, seemingly lost on the issue of whether Trump uh, colluded with the Russian government or whether he obstructed justice simply because well, that was the silver bullet. I mean, yeah. that, like that was the thing that they and I, I never paid any attention to anything involving Russia. And I felt like and I, I've said this before that like to me, it was like a um, a TV show mm-hmm. where I wait until TV shows are over. And then if it's if it's like if the it's consensus good. If the consensus is that the that the show was good, like Breaking Bad, right? Breaking Bad ended, and like the season finale was highly rated, and everyone was like, "This is one of the best TV shows ever." I went back and I marathoned it, and mm-hmm. it was great. Yeah. Um, but I, the, like the TV show Heroes, that's what mm-hmm. got me was because the first season was great, and then it just went downhill, and they had the writer strike, and I felt like I wasted years of my life watching that show. Yeah. And that's, that's how I was like, and so that scarred me for life. And I'm, that's how my, that's been my approach to a lot of things. And that's how I treated the Russia stuff is because I'm like, look, if Trump gets impeached and removed from office, I will go back and read all of that. No, that's like, smart. It's a smart and way find to out at. what happened. But yeah. if, if not, then all these people wasted years of their life. And it turns out they did that people spent Hours every day, hashtag resistance, following the Russia stuff. This is going to be what takes them down. And then it didn't. And they're like just grasping. And I understand that like in the Mueller report, there's tons of stuff that Trump did that like makes him not a virtuous person and not fit for office. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's a bunch of stuff that we knew. Yeah. Like Trump would do. But the silver bullet of like him plotting this like, you know, espionage, uh, like movie that people had in their heads turns out. Nope. Yeah. And like, what are they going to do? Like, what are they going to do to get ratings back up? (laughs) Basically like (laughs) they have to start a war. So I feel like the Democrats are going to like, you know, like, well, like not the Democrats, but like MSNBC and, and, you know, CNN are like, we should probably invade Iran because we got to get our cl- <laughs> we got to get these clicks up, man. Right? I bet you that's who uh, fired on that tanker in in the Gulf of Oman. Like, I bet it was Gulf MSNBC. <laughs> I bet Rachel Maddow is out there and in like a little boat, and she's firing oh, on these yeah. oil tankers trying to start a war. And uh. just because, like, because because these ratings are not as good as they as they were. No, she lost like half a million viewers after the Mueller report. It's kind of crazy, especially in the uh, the the young the what is it the twenty four to fifty demo something like that uh, yeah. twenty four to fifty nine demo. Uh, but yeah, I was gonna say something about the um, uh, about the Mueller report. It's uh, specifically about the collusion part because mm-hmm. anybody who's like followed Trump, uh, who like knows how he sort of does his business. Um, knew how dysfunctional his campaign was. Like it is an abs- it would be an absolute miracle if Trump colluded with the Russians because that would be the most organized his campaign would have ever been. Yeah, someone made a good point. My, like my friend Zach uh, Mabry m- made a good point that um, that it's like trying to prosecute uh, a pickup basketball game for like illegal trading. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like no one was no like Trump was just going around giving speeches and then the people who worked for him were trying to impress him. Yeah. 100%. It's it's, it's like it, it, well, it actually reminds me of uh there's a there's a debate within Holocaust studies about um how involved Hitler was uh in each of the each of the decisions that led to the Holocaust. Uh-huh. And uh there's so there's like one side is like he 
it was all the people under him. He didn't really know much. And uh, they just did all that stuff. And the other side is like, well, he no, he gave the order and he planned it all. And there's like a, there's a, a synthesis idea, which is interesting, called working towards the Fuhrer, where uh, like the person at the top just creates the conditions under which everyone under him tries to impress him mm-hmm. and tries to do things and tries to bring back results that will impress him. And so the organization as a whole becomes much more extreme and much more guided towards like just whatever you think will make the person happy. So I'm sure that all these people under Trump, that's, and, and, and that's how, that was what I suspected with the Russia stuff. It's just like Trump's got all these people under him running around and they're trying to do anything that will, uh, you know, help him out. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not checking with lawyers to make sure it's legal. They're just, you know, doing stuff. Yeah. And I don't know if you, I don't know if you've watched the whole lot of, uh, some of these or read up on some of the stuff about Hitler, but, uh, with respect to how people in Germany viewed him, he was almost basically a God. I mean, it Mm -hmm. it was, it, it was actually, he had to keep Eva Braun, his girlfriend in secret because, uh, the idea of him casting favor on any particular woman would have basically devastated like half the population because of, oh wow yeah yeah and so it's it, obviously it's very different for Trump because that's he, like a that's like these uh, these these musicians who they have like girlfriend you know they're like heartthrob musicians mm-hmm. and the, and they have girlfriends but they can't tell anyone because like if they did then it would be <laughs> they would uh. Like the people, every, everyone who has crushes on them would like, like would get angry. Oh, for sure, yeah. And, and it's it's a weird marketing. Uh, I mean, it's a weird way for people to think that they, you know, someone they have no connection, personal connection, no relationship with, will get angry at somebody potentially wanting to pursue happiness by uh, you know being with uh, a, a partner. Um, and so it, it's a little, I mean, bit I know different. when you announced that you had gotten engaged, I know there were just millions of women <laughs> all around the United States who were just so, and so don't forget upset. the gay men, don't forget the gay, the gay men. men who were just very upset <laughs> that, uh, that you were now off limits and oh, you're, man. I think your, uh, your numbers suffered. I was, I was watching your, your follower count and it went down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess I, I guess I should use this platform as an uh, as a uh, an opportunity to apologize to all of those <laughs> star-crossed lovers. Who... It's funny when when I uh, announced that like my wife was pregnant with Jewel mm-hmm. um, the first time, uh, my follower count went down. Wow! Like it, it, like by a lot, like not um, not like an incredible amount, but like several thousand. So you're just projecting onto me because I actually don't think exactly I lost any right. Where where it, it, it wasn't that I had a wife. It was like they now maybe they were smart and they were like, I'm getting out now because this guy is just going to post pictures of his baby. And, and, and that's true. Smart, which, which is, is exactly, exactly why. Happened. I, which is exactly why I unfollowed you. Exactly. And I don't blame you. I don't blame, I don't blame you one bit. Who wants to see that? So, oh, so maybe that's a smart thing. That's the that's the that's the smart thing. No, but I was going to say, you know, Trump in many ways is very uh, different. Just getting back to our point, in the sense that he's viewed by many people as sort of like the not. I wouldn't say the Messiah, but he's a he has very Messiah like qualities that uh that sort of that you know say the the evangelical block of voters sort of Mm -hmm. projected onto him that like god sent him down to save america from you know the globalists and the people who are trying to you know take this country away from us uh, and and us being yeah and i mean they have a point not in the sense that he's the messiah but they have a point in the sense that like the way the demographics are going trump may be their last shot Right, hundred like percent. If and and the, I think they're they're right. I think that uh, after Trump, if it goes to a Democrat, um, I don't think that after that, you know, the way the percentages are are, are moving, you know, and who knows what will happen with that. But like, like they have to do something, otherwise they're out of power. Right. Um, especially this is how the white nationalists talk. Is they're like. After Trump, there's no political solution, and that's ominous because they're implying when they need something else. Yeah. Um, but but that's you know it's like it's, Pence isn't going to save them. 
They no. like they need another. They need a Trump 2.0, mm-hmm. and that's very difficult to recreate when Trump is just taking so much oxygen out of the room. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what the trap. That's kind of the trap that Democrats fell into with Obama. Is like they, Obama, sucked up so much oxygen out of the Democratic cir- out of Democratic circles that there was no um, lineup behind them to fill the void. So. The, the Republicans are gonna if 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 Trump doesn't win in twenty twenty, like I I don't see uh, a Republican as polarizing or as even charismatic mm-hmm. as Trump coming up through the ranks to say steal the spotlight from from them. Let's move to we we're about you know we're, we're like we're hitting about an hour mm-hmm. and uh, I wanted to talk real quick about which Democratic candidates you think are strongest against uh, against Trump. You, you, you've you written the most about Biden mm-hmm. recently. I have. Um, and I, I mean, it only makes sense to continue writing about him because he is the front runner. Mm-hmm. Um, in South Carolina, where you're from, you know yeah. very well that it's the first majority minority state that holds a primary Mm-hmm. And um, is arguably more reflective of how the country votes as a whole, because uh, in Iowa and New Hampshire, it's majority white states. So you're not going to have the same type of um, vote that you have uh, anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And Biden right now in South Carolina has 50 percent support from black voters. So he has 50 percent mm-hmm. of all African-Americans in South Carolina. And um, who's, uh, the, who's the mayor of uh of of South Bend, uh, Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg uh, is has is polling at zero percent among African Americans in South yes. Carolina, which I thought was funny. Yeah, so it's it's interesting to see some of these candidates going out now doing outreach to uh, black voters because Biden doesn't have to do any of that because he right. did it for eight years by being Obama's vice president, and mm-hmm. people don't forget that that was his you know. That that his 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 most recent uh, office holding was being the vice president, and so long as he doesn't do something incredibly stupid or disqualifying, Biden's getting the nomination. Like Elizabeth Warren, as much as she's surging in the polls, um, Bernie she has a massive problem with Bernie clogging up her progressive lane. It's uh, uh, until one of those two drop out of the race, you're not going to see. Uh, a strong enough threat against mm-hmm. Biden from getting this nomination. And it's going to mainly come from black voters um, who are going to carry the uh, nominee to the finish line. And right now, it, all signs point to Biden. Of course, he could be like the Jeb Bush of the race because he was highly touted in 2016 <laughs> and he could easily blow it. And Biden has done that uh, both in 2008 and 1988. But the key difference here is that he now has a majority support of black voters, and that's going to be the difference. And um, uh, Biden arguably is the strongest to run against Trump. Um, while he is not, um, he certainly has his baggage. It's not like Hillary Clinton level baggage, but it is certainly baggage. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look to obviously his plagiarism scandal in 1988 that undid his, uh, his uh, presidential run then. I don't um, think people care about plagiarism. That's that's probably true. I, I, I would, mean, people people who work in journalism do because yeah, they don't I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm saying this like th- this is very much in my head that people care yeah. about. Yeah. Um, uh, th- what what it came to like the Me Too accusations against him for like inappropriately touching a woman on her shoulders and then sniffing her hair like that wasn't mm-hmm. enough to undo him. If anything, since then his poll numbers have gone even higher up. And then you have, for example, his comments about segregation, um, mm-hmm. about um, you know, you know, Indians at Seven Eleven, or <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, like that stuff is just not enough to undo him. And then when you're running against a guy like Trump, you're comparing. It's like night and day. You're comparing because you have all these things that Trump said on the record. You have him in an Access Hollywood tape. Bragging about grabbing women by the pussy yeah. and you're trying to bring Biden down for sniffing a woman's hair like that to mm-hmm. some voters, that just doesn't make sense. Right. So so do you think Biden has a good shot? Uh, I think at, he has a great shot. Trump? 
I think he has a great shot. Um, I would probably put it at 60-40 right now. The only reason I would in say— In favor of Biden? In favor of Biden. Wow. The only reason I say that right now, um, that it's not higher, is because the economy is still doing pretty well and we're not involved in another war. And I would still put my doubts at 40% because um, the, like the polls that we're seeing right now, I feel like people are sort of regressing into that area where— um, in 2016, everybody sort of bought into the polling that showed Hillary Clinton winning. Um, and they never expected Trump to win. Like there were people that just said Trump will never be president. You heard it from Obama. You heard it to Rosie O'Donnell. You heard it. You know, everybody was basically saying Trump's not going to be president. And then. Right. But Hillary Clinton was so unlikable in 2016. You could put up anybody else against Trump and they would have beaten him. Like that, mm. people wake up in the morning hating Hillary Clinton or the Clintons in general because of, you know, whatever Bill Clinton did, whatever Hillary do, did as Secretary of State or a Senator from New York or as First Lady and the whole Whitewater, Monica Lewinsky thing. And um, basically, Trump was, in many ways, the, uh, while he was not the perfect candidate to run in from the Republican Party standpoint, um, a lot of these never Trumpers ended up voting for him anyways because they could not stomach seeing Hillary as president. Mm. It's it's like that Douglas Adams uh, bit in um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy about two lizards running for president, <laughs> 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 and like they're basically both the same, but right. they'll always vote for their lizard because they don't want the other lizard to win. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now l- l- let's uh, let's finish off by talking about um, Muslims and politics. Oh, um, great! Pro or con? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> what? What? Now, the last election, like Islam was was a very big in the political discussion, but it was it was only as like a an object of discussion where mm-hmm. Muslims were being talked about, and it was mostly through Trump and his Islamophobia. Um, this time around. Muslims are being talked about and talked by these Muslims who are in office and who are who the Republican Party is seems to be focusing on for in, in order to divide the like the Democratic Party. Obviously, we're talking about you know Ellen Omar, Rashid mm-hmm. Tlaib, and what, what's your sense of how how Muslims are going to be? you know, engaged in politics in the election and also about how Islam is going to be spoken of, uh, you know, in the, in the election. Um, what's interesting about Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib is that if they were not as polarizing as they would be or, or, or as they've been, um, I doubt you would have many of the discussions that have been happening about Israel and Palestine, um, that we've been having. So Mm -hmm. for example, the amount of lobbying that we've had in Washington with respect to APAC, of course, I think many of the comments that Rashida Tlaib and Elon Omar have made are problematic and cross into the realm of anti-Semitic. Um, and I, I'm not big fans of either one of them. Um, but I'm arguably not a fan of anybody in politics, let's be honest. Yeah, I'm not a big right. fan of any politician. Um, but I think they've been a little, I think they've been more damaging. I think they've been a bit damaging to sort of when you get more Muslims in politics or in positions of power, like this is the result you're going to get. You're not going to see like a well reasoned person say, for example, uh, uh, like, um, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Indiana Congressman uh, Andre Carson. Andre mm-hmm. Carson, who is a Muslim convert, has not made a single peep or a controversial statement about anything. Um, uh, many people aren't talking about him because he's not saying a whole lot about these issues. If anything, he sort of uh, towed the Democratic Party line and just gone, you know, charted his own path. Um, yeah, it's, but, it's almost like Muslims aren't allowed to just be like regular dudes. Yeah, like, it's, it's, you know, isn't that weird? Like, I, I mean... It, I've almost had to play up how Muslim I am because I see right. like you got to make jokes about dude. Sharia law and stuff. Yeah. yeah, like I joke about that all the time, and like Emily's just like, you, g- you got to stop joking about that. Like, <laughs> and people people find it funny. So long as people find it funny, I, I want to continue joking about it. Yeah. Um, I don't think it, I, I think 
the reason why I continue to talk about Sharia law is because I want to get it to the point where it's defanged so much mm-hmm. that people aren't just so scared to just talk about it, regardless of like uh, if they want to like say compare policies to what would happen say in a country that's governed by Sharia law versus governed by the United States Constitution. Like you, you would see that maybe it's. I, I'm not saying that the United States should adopt Sharia law at all. I'm just saying. I'm saying that. You're not saying that, but I'm saying <laughs> I just say that, like, you know, don't be so fearful of everything that's foreign to you. That's all. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> so I actually, I wrote a piece, uh, I think, right after the Alabama abortion ban, that uh, Sharia law is actually a lot more uh, lax on abortion laws than the uh, Alabama abortion bill. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think that got a lot of looks because people were like, what the hell? Like, what, what, why was Sharia law kind of being brought into place here? It's right. because people were making that comparison that the, the, the Alabama abortion bill was nothing but Christian Sharia law, which is obviously not true. Um, it was canon yeah. law. It was the Pope. <laughs> it was the, <laughs> these, these Jesuit infiltrators uh, trying to destroy America. Yeah, we've been so worried about Sharia creeping into the United States, we completely forgot about creeping canon law. That's the point of Islamophobia, <laughs> is, is, is we are... Yeah, but uh, with respect... Catholics are playing it up so that everyone's attention is on that. Yeah, but I, then, I do think, I think the more well-reasoned, rational Muslims you find just on the public sphere, just talking about American politics, they don't make it about, you know, their own identity. I mean, you have a couple of individuals. You have Bernie Sanders' uh, campaign manager. I think it's, uh, I'm trying to remember. He's a, he's a Muslim guy. I think it's, mm-hmm. well, there's, a, there's another guy, Walid Shahid. He is over uh, at this Democratic progressive group. Like, they're talking about actual, and I, I disagree with them on policy, but like they are out there talking about politics and not about their own identities, which I respect because you should be out there talking about what matters to you the most without having to make everything about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that should be, I, I think that's where American Muslims sort of need to get over the hump. Like you should care about a policy because you care about it because it's the right thing to do, not because it is that you are Muslim and that this is what, you know, the, the Quran tells you what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, the same argument can be made about, you know, uh, Christians or Catholics or Protestants or what have you who are in positions of power who sort of try to make every single argument about what would happen if, say, Jesus were here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what you've seen from... Uh, Catholic or Protestant or or evangelical politicians, but there are a lot of them tr- that make their that that use their faith to influence how they govern. Yeah, um, I'm I'm lot, I think I'm a lot more comfortable with that than than you are in terms of uh, you know how how informed how how much faith informs your 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 your, your, your politics. I think that's kind of unavoidable and and fine. Um, I think that. It, it really makes a difference whether you think you're you're operating from a position of strength. So I think that if you are comfortable uh, in your in your country and and you feel like you're 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 part of it, um, I think that there's a sense in which your um, the like your arguments are going to be more universal um, mm-hmm. and. Like and I, I think that's true of um, I think it's true of of nationalism, where for white people nationalism is just nationalism, right? Um, but as the white population declines as a percentage of the population, you're going to see like, and also as a, as a, as a reaction to a lot of um, anti-white kind of you know rhetoric. You're gonna see a lot more white people who wouldn't otherwise strongly identify as white uh, start identifying very self-consciously as white, mm-hmm. um, and because part of the luxury of being white, you know, historically in America, is just that you're just normal, right? Mm-hmm. And you're just a normal, dude. And by normal, you mean white. Yeah. Um, but but now you're like, oh no, it's an ethnicity now, and so we're gonna start voting as a as a voting block. Yeah. Um, and. That's a you know kind of dangerous thing, and that's you know why people are sort of looking towards you know d- demographic change as either a bad thing for white nationalists or as white like, genocide 
Oh yeah, white genocide. Or or it's spoken of as like the hope. We're like, well, this is like once we're done with Trump, like it, that's that's it because you know white people won't have the numbers to really get together and and just like you know win a majority. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of people are putting their eggs in that basket. Um, and so all we gotta do is prevent Trump from building the wall for like five more years, and then it'll be fine. Right, and it's um, it's it's. I, I just want to make this one point. I don't know if you had, you were trying to finish up, but basically. Nationalism wasn't always considered a very politically, a, a very racially charged term until right. Trump really came on the scene, and you had this massive uh, migrant crisis, not only coming from Latin America but also coming from the Middle East into Europe, and it all of a sudden became about uh, the demographic shifts, as, as you just mentioned. And I think that, that's interestingly what the Israeli-Palestinian debate has become between the one state and two state solution is that people who are very pro one state solution um, or or at least the critics of that particular plan understand that the demographics will shift uh, skewing against Jewish, the Jewish majority in which Israel will no longer become a Jewish state because you Mm -hmm. would then obviously have the right of return. And that would um, sort of erode the fabric that, um, many Jews believe that Israel was founded upon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like w- when I talk about demographic change, changing how people think about politics, I'm thinking about, you know, particularly how Catholics view politics right now. You know, Catholicism, at least practicing Catholicism, like people who are practicing Catholics are, are a, a lesser and lesser percentage of the population. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that means that the ones who stay behind or the ones who convert um, you know, converts are usually the more extreme people in any religion. Right. Um, and they are like, be, because they're the minority, they now feel way more comfortable using kind of sectarian language, um, where they are self-consciously identifying as Catholic people and mm-hmm. Catholic, whereas, you know, in countries that are majority Catholic, they might just be making arguments based on reason, yeah. Um, and that, that anyone can, you know, ap- ap- apply to. So I see that happening where Catholicism, because it's declining, um, it's w- which means that the sort of people who might be lukewarm, you know, just regular people are dropping out. The ones who are left are going to be much more, you know, devout, uh, much more serious, much more intellectual and are going to be seeking a specifically Catholic way of doing politics. And that's why I think a lot of the debate right now between like the national review and first things, um, is, is about is, is like that, uh, well, we've been losing, <laughs> yeah. right? We, like we've been just crushed, uh, as social conservatives, as, as Christians and what we've been doing has not been working. So, uh, why not just argue for monarchy, you know, like, like, and I'm like, all right, well, that's fine. Uh, but I, I like, it, it's just, it's, it's clearly just a result of that change in dynamics, um, yeah. and, and change in demographics. And so as Muslims, uh, increase in the United States, um, and turn all the churches into mosques, but like <laughs> as, as that, as that happens, uh, I think you'll see, I mean, especially if Biden takes office and things, become people start behaving more reasonably perhaps towards Muslims. I think you'll see like Muslim identity politics, like possibly decline. Um, and it won't be such a self-referential or or, uh, like a self-defense kind of like, well, Trump is being Islamophobic. So we have to rally and, you know, respond to him and, and and become kind of the mirror image of him. Yeah. So you might see if Biden takes office, you you know, you might see Muslim Republicans take office. um, Yeah. And I think you're people being a lot more, a a lot more, more comfortable just being regular guys. And that's, you know, what's interesting is that before 9-11, there was a significantly higher percentage of Muslim Americans who were Republican. Mm -hmm. And as soon as, you know, the Patriot Act came into existence under Bush and uh, the Iraq War, that really turned them off to being Republicans. And I think I I even saw people like my parents who voted for Bush in 2000 switch over to Kerry in 2004 because of everything that happened in those four years. Um, And 
not saying obviously that um, they agree. They so, obviously they don't support what happened on nine eleven. But to be the or the state. Well, I switched. <laughs> I switched. Uh, I mean, I switched from two thousand, and you know, I was supported. I mean, I was fifteen, but I, you know, my family supported Bush in two thousand. Yeah, and then I supported uh, Kerry in two thousand four. Yeah, and, and that was like just. But, the, but that was because I did support nine eleven. Yeah, so I, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was the state. I mean, there was the state's reaction to Muslim Americans. There was just this wide. Uh, sweeping of targeting of them, and everybody became a suspect. Mm-hmm. And um, I think you'll probably get to the the point where once those net, those identity politics sort of wither wither away under a president who is not um, perceived to have gone after that particular group, um, I think you'll probably find that more Republicans will be like you will find people who will oppose. Uh, whatever Democratic president comes next, because of an issue that they were supposed to undo, mm. uh, they never fulfilled that promise. And I think you saw plenty of Muslim critics of the Obama presidency simply because of his drone war, the Libya war. Um, mm. And that's only if they had their eyes open. I mean, the, the thing is, people oftentimes get apathetic when the people that they like are in power. And, right. and, and we just mentioned it earlier in the podcast. Yeah, we, we spend, you know, it's brunch. Yeah, it's brunch. And if Hitler was in power, we'd all be at brunch right now. And that's, that is the problem, the fundamental well, problem. S- well, Siraj, thank you so much for coming on uh, for an hour and 17 minutes. I am going, uh, after I get off uh, with you, I'm going to therapy for an hour. <laughs> And the, the difference is I have to pay the therapist and I should, I should, I should have paid you for this, but oh, uh, th- thank you, Jeremy. I really but, appreciate but it. But thank you. Th- th- thank you very much for coming on. Give my best and, to uh, Stephanie and Julie. I will. I will, man. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, good luck with everything. Thanks, buddy. You too. I'll talk to you soon. Yep. See ya. That concludes another episode of Holy Wars. Thank you so much for listening and don't forget to subscribe, share it on social media, Rate it five stars on iTunes and donate to the Patreon. Every little bit helps keep this project moving forward. Until next time, I'm Jeremy McClellan. Thank you for listening.